and one of which you, your family and friends should all be very, very proud of. Secondly, I also feel very honoured to share this experience with you and to receive my honorary doctorate from my home institution. It's just short of 30 years since I was where you are now seated. 30 years and it's flown by, I can tell you. I found that graduation speeches follow a set format. Someone you have never heard of usually stands up, tries to find some words of wisdom, some good advice, and then tells you that you should find your own life's passion and follow it. I tried to see if I could remember my graduation speech and whether I acted on any of the advice that I was given. I asked my friends and colleagues, some of them are here in this room, the same question. The evidence will suggest that graduates rarely take the advice or perhaps even remember it after spending the rest of the day either a temple bar or somewhere like that. <laughs> the best advice that I was given, and that was about a year or so after I qualified from one of the most distinguished mentors I had at the time, was not to do surgery. So what did I do? I ignored him. So, I won't waste your time as the one thing I could remember was the graduation speaker who was a serious barrier between a thirsty crowd, warm, and a cold and refreshing drink. Not a safe place to stand. Actually, I'll tell you a lie, and I've got one piece of advice, but I'm going to save it till the end of this talk. These speeches, as I said before, usually a great passionate plea for you to find your life's passion and to follow it. Well, you've already found it. You know your life's passion, you want to be doctors, and it's a done deal. That is at least six minutes of the standard graduation speech that I can't copy from someone else. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to make a few observations and tell you a few stories. They mean something to me, and I very much hope they mean something to you. Most of you will know me, or who I am, because what you've heard, Professor Kelly, is inflated, a very inflated introduction. Or because you were tr trying to politely pass the time by reading the programme. It won't be long. Bringing you the iPhone out of such an occasion is socially acceptable, but not yet. Maybe my name is a little familiar, but you're not sure why. It may be because you've heard when I became frustrated with the efficiency of bringing patients to the operating theatre, I decided to be a porter in my own institution. An interesting story that and I remember going to the CEO of the hospital and I had to get his pardon just in case I was caught in the corridors of the hospital and someone took me or locked me up for a mental illness of some sort. Uh, I got the pardon and I got the, the actual uniform and I remember doing a shift on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock. I promise you this, and this is something for you to remember. The minute I put the porter's uniform on, everyone who I've had years being the professor of surgery, huge contact with. Within that hour, I've lost all that contact. I think the most notable one was my own students, actually. Having that porter's uniform completely disconnected me from that team, and, and I tried my best at the time to make that eye contact. I had a fairly busy shift, which went on. I remember one lady who was about 25, pregnant, seriously nauseated, took her to the obstetrics ward, puked on the way twice, arrived there, and the midwife gave me a serious bollocking on the day. Why did I actually arrive to the ward without actually calling the ward? So that patient sentiment became a very important part of my career. The funny thing, at the end of the shift, about three o'clock, I went to the A&E to take a blood sample to the lab, and on it, being a clinician, doctor, I read what it said, and it said, group and cross match, four units of blood, because the patient has an upper GI bleed. So, I took the blood, left it alone, end of the shift, changed it to my clothes, went home, went to sleep by 3, 3 30, 4 o'clock. About 6 o'clock I got a phone call from the registrar on call, who reminded me something I completely forgot, that I was covering one of my colleagues who was taking his family to Gatwick Airport. And he said to me, I have a patient with an upper GI bleed, 
Sadly, he's bleeding. Could you please come and give me a hand because I haven't done many of these. So I went in there and I gave him a quick hand and we, the operation was over about seven o'clock. And then I went back home, couldn't sleep. About nine o'clock, one of my distinguished gastroenterologists, and we have a president here who is of the same discipline, called me to say, Ari, he said, you're the professor of surgery, you need to be aware of this. Apparently there's a porter in the hospital who's operating on your patients. <laughs> That is maybe the story you've heard. <laughs> or you may have heard that I was once called a goat, and you will be called all sorts of things in your career. Just remember that. Actually, I was called a tethered goat in the previous British government. You see, some people will tell you that when the English press aren't too busy hacking phones or bringing police, bribing police officers, they spend their time inventing clever things, like GOATS, which stands for Government of All Talents. And it was Gordon Brown's attempt to bring some outsiders into his government. That's how I ended up being a health minister, which is why this is a wonderful job, because you always get to do the most important things. And I'm not talking about being a politician. I was asked to join the government because I was a doctor. And that was an amazing, an amazing experience, as most cases petrified when I started that. And part of that job was to take legislation through Parliament. And I'll tell you this next second story. This was my first bill going through the House of Lords. And the civil servants give you a speech to read, and that takes about 20 minutes, and you can't really stand up and speak, you have to read it word for word. I gave my speech, and I realized there are 30 other peers gonna actually contribute to this very important debate. The bill was about human fertilization and embryology bill, highly controversial issue, had moral issue, ethical issue, scientific and clinical issues. So I did my speech, I sat down, and about 8 o'clock in the evening, which is about four to five hours later, this very, very distinguished QC, and I'm not breaking any confidence, you've just taken the oath, this is all in the public domain, his name is Lord Brennan, stood up, an Irishman, very, very smart, and he essentially destroyed my speech and the actual bit in the most eloquent way. And you probably will realize in life there's a surgical way of saying things, and there's a very nice way of saying things. The latter is much more painful, as you've graduated now. And he sat down, and there was some other Baroness who followed him from the northern part of this island. Baroness Paisley wasn't as eloquent speaker as a previous speaker. And uh, as she was speaking, I heard a big thump. I could turn around and I see good old Lord Brennan, who's just given his fantastic speech, although a very painful one to me, has fallen on the red benches and everyone was leaving the chamber, all the peers. And most of these guys are very senior people. I could see them from the corner of my eye. So the whole chamber was empty and I jumped, as most of you will end up doing, you jump over the benches, went up to him, felt his carotid and he was dead, stone dead, no pulse on There I was, finding myself a bat, 20 whatever years later, after he qualified, this is 2007, 2007, resuscitating this man uh, who is a, a lawyer in front of the BBC cameras, which are still going live. And the last time I've resuscitated anyone would have been at St. Vincent's Hospital when I was a surgical house officer in the AE department, which wasn't the most pleasant experience. So, there we are, giving him a cardiac massage and a mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, not a very pleasant thing to do. Uh, and six minutes into it, and nothing happened. So I screamed for a defibrillator, and guess what? The ushers walked in with the defibrillator, and I could see in front of my eyes my whole, not just clinical, political career, which I didn't really care about, but my clinical career was about to disappear. So about to shock him, I remembered one thing, look around just in case someone is touching your patient. And who do I see? I see someone wearing a white satin dress. It wasn't a saint. It was the Archbishop of York. He was the second in command in the Church of England. 
So at least he was separate from that. So I shocked this guy. And I shocked him. And I could tell you, as I put the defibrillator on, this thing started to talk to me, by the way, which I've never experienced before. <laughs> this new defibrillators, the, the days I trained in the AE department, these defibrillators didn't talk to you, but this one did. And this patient had a VF. I shocked him and I got him back. It was the most euphoric moment of my life. I can tell you that much. It was so euphoric that I turned around and I pointed at the Archbishop of York and I said to him, I beat you. <laughs> and, and I and you will every day in your life, almost every day of your life, get a feeling of that nature. And it's all the better because we do it together, whether it's porters and professors, and remember that, whether it's doctors and nurses, whether there are cleaners and consultants, whether there are surgeons and scientists. We celebrate, we mourn together, we can overcome our failures, and we move from our mistakes. We can shout about our successes and celebrate our victories because we've done them together. And remember that, you're not alone, certainly not in the era that you're going to be working in practicing medicine. Being a doctor is something to be treasured. It's not just what you do, it becomes who you are, a part of your identity. It gives you a place. It gives you your place with your friends and family. It gives you your place where you work. It gives you your place in society. And it's because it gives you place that means you should wander. That place is a privilege, but it can breed lazy complacency. You've made it, why do more? Why not simply reap the fruits? The reason to wander is the journey which is part of my life. As you've heard earlier, I was born in Baghdad to an Armenian parents. I could have never imagined standing before you today. I came to Ireland to study, and there were very few people in 1978 who looked like me, and most of them were actually studying at RCSI. You very quickly build the Irish accent, as some of you have in this room, to the shock of your parents, including those who sent you in a very expensive private schools in England. So quickly, be fitting with the wonderful Irish sense of humor, everyone here has a nickname. So if you are Patrick, usually called it Paddy. If you are Ara, I was called Dara. If your surname is Darcy, it must fit into something. And in those days, it fitted into Darcy. So very quickly, my nickname was Dara Darcy, the dark Paddy who graduated from surgeons. <laughs> As you have seen today. I met my wonderful wife, Wendy, and we have traveled through life side by side ever since. With the exception of our Bichon Frisk dogs, my children, Freddie and Nina, are the best part of my life. But I digress and back to the journey. I went to England for my specialist training. An Irish medical director who, worked, who I worked for took a gamble, and I promise you, it was a gamble, and I was appointed as a consultant at a reasonably young age, as you've heard, of 31. In these days, I would have considered I would have been considered by my surgical colleagues and community as still being in my nappies. And the advice at the time was, don't do it. I did it on my own terms, took the job after completing my training. Following that, I came across the dean of a medical school who took a gamble and appointed me to the chair of surgery. I think, though, his master plan was to shut down the academic department of surgery by appointing as I had no formal training in academic surgery. I've never been a lecturer, I've never been a senior lecturer. But a bit like my cooking skills, I could cook, but I've never been a proper chef. Subsequently, a health minister asked me to review the health care for London, and you've heard some of the outputs from uh, Professor Kelly. And then the Prime Minister took the greatest gamble of all by appointing me as a health minister. What is unique, as per my first challenging decision, the overall majority of people at each stage told me, 
not to do it. However deep in there, I knew if I stick to the values and principles that I learned from this place and for some of the great people who I've worked for, it's all doable and the threat can be made into a golden opportunity. And that's one thing you'll remember leaving Ireland. You can always turn anything on its head. But the point of the journey isn't to be carried along. It isn't to go along for the ride or hitch along with others. Life isn't a novel, by the way. It is an autobiography. You make choices every day and you can choose to accept the world as it is or to shape it to what it should be. I've always been an outsider and an Armenian in Iraq, an Iraqi in Ireland, an Iraqi Irish in England, a doctor, not a politician, and an engineer, not a scientist, a scientist and not a doctor. It always, always made me question why. Why cannot they be different? I've never been armed, certainly, with any of these answers. I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person to quote a Kennedy at an Irish graduation ceremony, and I won't be the last. But when I reach a juncture, I often recall the famous Robert Kennedy quote. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? Now, I don't quite dream these things, I promise you, at night like Robert Kennedy would have. But my career has been about embracing the journey, taking the unusual route, and always, always asking, why not? You never know where life will take you, but only you have the courage to know if you're moving forward and if you're asking the questions that matter along the, along the way. You have achieved so much already, and you have so much more ahead of you. Promise is a special gift that slips away as life unfurls. Only you can fulfill it. On that piece of advice that I said at the beginning, I said I had one piece of advice, and it is watch where you step in hospitals, <laughs> or look after your hospital porters, and always, always know how to work a modern defibrillator. Thank you.